Kevin, welcome back. Last time out we were talking about risk management, but our focus today moves us on to the topic of information security policies. Now, just before we get down to the main business of the session, for any listeners who might not have heard the first podcast, perhaps it would be useful for us to start with a brief reminder of your professional background in this area. Hi Steve, it's nice to be back, thank you. This is my 32nd year as an independent information security consultant, much to my surprise. The differential I bring to the market is that I take a business view rather than a technical view of information security. My studies at Melbourne University took me to a Master of Commerce degree, but four years later uh, I was managing a computer centre in the 1960s and my accountant's mind was worrying about security. Then that led to uh, research I did into computer related crime in Australia and soon I was training fraud squads in collecting evidence for the prosecution. I also developed a risk management and an IT disaster recovery methodologies before I began independent consulting in 1980. Now as I contemplate an easier life, I've captured my hard-won intellectual property into three manuals, risk management, policy standards and procedures which we'll talk about today, and business continuity management, perhaps in the future. They are available from my website, www.fitzgeraldinfosecmentoring.com, which I hope our listeners might visit to see just what is on offer and, and why it may interest them. I look forward to mentoring people in this field in my future. My approach to today's topic, policies, information security policies, emerged from my early risk management exercises that I conducted in the early 80s, in in the late 70s, when I could see a gap relating to the management of people in relation to controls. I realised that if we did not manage people properly, technical controls would not be as effective as they could be. I believed there was a strong need to support the IT-based controls with personnel controls, which could guide management and staff to acceptable business habits. These controls were based on using policies, standards and procedures that spoke to management and staff about their security responsibilities and provided guiding structures addressing such areas as incident management, information classification and business continuity. Many others as well, as we'll see. These controls are popular because they're not expensive. They can be well managed with effective penalties and promotion. Importantly, they also produce a step change in the security awareness culture of management and staff in each organisation that have implemented them. This need eventually saw ISO standards emerge, but their adoption still needs encouragement, as we will discuss. Okay, Kevin, thank you. I think that sets the scene nicely on where you're coming from on it. So let's move down to the main topic of the discussion. Why is security policy important and where do you see it fitting in to the wider picture of information security as a whole? Well firstly, an explanation. When I hear policy, I also hear the derivations as I call them, the standards and the guidelines or procedures. All three policies, standards and procedures are necessary to make sense of the responsibility and to effectively communicate that responsibility. In my opinion, policy is for executive understanding and commitment and for recording formal acceptance of the policies. Standard is a measurable statement relating to a policy that is used by senior management to manage operations staff and procedures are more detailed instructions explaining how the standards be carried out or followed. So I'm moving from policies in executive suite, standards is senior management, and procedures are the people on the, in the office or on the shop floor. Okay, so can you give us a working definition of each of them? Well, yes. To expand on this, for me to make this work effectively, a policy is a sentence. For example, ITDR plans shall be independently tested at least once a year. Some people call this the strategic level. A standard is a paragraph. For instance, the annual ITDR test shall be planned to start in the first year as desktop walkthroughs. In years two and three, more realistic walkthroughs will be designed with surprise absences and unforeseen difficulties introduced. In year four and beyond, offline testing involving failover and failback operations will be conducted. 
All tests shall be observed and quantitatively evaluated by an independent assessment panel. And some people call this the tactical level. And finally, the procedure. A procedure is a page of details, for example, nominating ITDR leaders and deputies to follow our example, participants and reserves, uh, resources required including recovery scripts, budget items, brief descriptions of scenarios to choose from, etc. And some call this the operational level, a page of procedures. So who would you say is the owner of each of these levels, thinking about it in an organisational context? I use the following ownership model. Policies are strategic executive tools. They have executive owners and they should be reported on at regular inter intervals throughout the year and as necessary. Standards are tactical senior management tools and are owned by corporate department heads and should be reported on regularly each month at least. And guidelines are operational tools and are owned by operational management, supervisors and staff who shall be aware of and use such guidelines on a daily basis to ensure that information they handle remains secure. Each level of management will strive to meet the demands expressed in their level of responsibility and will be judged on their ability to do this. Where standards and operations are not met, there will be a preliminary warning and or a penalty, and this must be a meaningful penalty. My view is that after years of experience, when penalties are not present to any security policy, it indicates that management is not really committed to the policy. But penalties must fit into the culture of the organisation as well, of course. So what you've said so far seems largely to place policy in the context of management. What about the linkage and the applicability to staff in general? It is true that the major weight of making the policies effective lies in assuring that the intent of the policy is interpreted in the standard and the intent of the standard is interpreted in, detail, in further details in procedures. It is in staff actions that the rubber hits the roads. The policy and standards levels hold the governance and the enforcement authority, but the procedures themselves direct staff to execute the intent so that information remains secure. So how does this get promoted to the staff? How do they find out about it? Well, policies, standards and guidelines or procedures must be part of the governance risk audit process. For mature security wear organisations, they become part of the culture, part of the normal business practice. A major benefit of having effective policy standards and guidelines is that they can generate a security consciousness or culture that becomes part of the acceptable behaviour throughout the business activities at all levels. This is a powerful force which disapproves of shortcuts and security transgressions as part of the corporate conversation. So what does a policy need to cover? In fact, although I'm talking about policy here as a singular, I guess it's fair to highlight that the number of policies are likely to be needed. So what's the overall scope of policy areas that you'd advise organisations to be considering? I take my lead from ISO 27001, Information Security Management Systems, which includes at Annex A, control objectives and controls. These control objectives and controls contain the framework which can be interpreted for individual organisations as policies, standards and procedures. And that's what I've done in my practice. In my mind, the control objectives represent the one sentence policy for each area. The controls themselves represent the one paragraph standard for each area and the application of the control to the particular business can be expressed as the procedures that must be in place to establish and maintain the control. ISO 27001 control objectives are as listed on your screen right now. You will note the breadth of these controls covering assets, human resources, physical security, communications and so on. All are essential elements. The list from 1 to 11 talks about security policy itself, organisation of the inf information security, asset management, human resources, physical environment, communications and operations, Access control, always been a, been a primary interest of the IT world. Information systems acquisition, development and maintenance. Information security incident management. Business continuity management and compliance. In addition to these control objectives and controls, there is a need to consider specific new threats that have emerged as a result of the information transformation age. These threats relate to mobile technology, including bring your own device use of social networking at work, cloud security, 
the opening of email attachments and large data stores, big data in other words. Now this raises a potentially interesting question about the specificity of a policy. As you say, new things tend to emerge in terms of technologies and services that an organisation will use and access. So how specific should the policy be about these? What's the balance between policy not being so specific that it needs continued revision versus being specific enough that people can actually relate it to their own use? Policies must be general enough to cover each area intended in a brief manner so that they will hold true and remain effective as the information landscape changes. Each of the 11 ISO 27001 control objectives can be expressed as a policy, and I've done this for many years now. The emerging areas mentioned above may all be accommodated within the asset management policy. The standards cover responsibility for assets and information classification. Work anywhere, anytime can be covered under the human resource security section. Below each standard will sit the procedures and this is where the detail will address BYOD, social networking, cloud security, email care and so on. There's no hard and fast rule here. The fear that bring your own device brings to some organisations may mean that they prefer to add a special standard within the asset management policy addressing BYOD or social networking. To emphasise the need to effectively control and establish procedures to clearly communicate what is needed in this emerging environment to provide a comfortable working, workable fit. It is the detailed procedures which will pick up the changing information landscape. Policies rarely change. Standards get tightened or broadened from time to time and procedures get tuned whenever it's required. Surveys often seem to suggest that policies are in less widespread use than the technical controls like antivirus and firewalls. Do you agree with this? And if so, why do you think that's the case? Yes, it is true in my experience and I believe this, the reasons behind this are that business has handed responsibility for information security over to IT management without communicating that it has done so. This has resulted, it seems, in business thinking that they will not have to be concerned about information security. They have, to a large extent, confused IT security with information security. Business, it seems, is thinking that IT is looking after information security and IT is thinking that business is looking after information security. A second point. With IT in control, technical controls will naturally be emphasised as a security baseline focusing on prevention and detection, antivirus and firewalls for instance. However, if business was to take a stance in emphasising information security, the controls it focuses on would include information in all of its formats, printed, electronic files, archives, whiteboards, storages and mobile devices, emails, waste paper, tape backups. So it it would include a wider focus. Business would include a broader range of control strategies to add to the typical prevent and detect which the technical uh, controls usually consist of. This would be derived from control strategies such as avoid, deter, recover, ensure, recruit, train and accept. This focus would bring a much more balanced approach into the mix with IT's technology based controls now, I think we both agree that focusing on technical controls at the expense or exclusion of policies isn't a good choice. What do you see as the potential disadvantages and indeed risks of doing so? By ignoring policies, particularly as I define them as a triumvirate, if you like, of policy standards and procedures, an organisation misses out on being able to speak to its personnel about the human aspects of information security. If management and staff are told clearly what is expected of them in their daily duties and what penalties will be enforced if they transgress the expected standards, a major proportion of personnel will do their very best to uphold a new standard of behaviour. At the very least, the expected behaviour has been expressed when in many cases today that is not the case. It always surprises me that business has not classified its information, for instance. Perhaps it could be public, class, a corporate class and a restricted or private class. How much more understanding and focused to control our mission critical information would we have if this was done and so often it is not? 
Personnel-based policies, standards and procedures also tend to involve a broader range of control, as already described, involving avoid, deter, prevent, detect, recover, ensure, recruit, train and or accept. Technical controls tend to be limited to prevention and detection. Policies can address more closely information security around personnel behaviour than technical controls by themselves can. The broader scope of policies encourages personnel to take control of their own behaviours by knowing what information assets are valuable and what they must do to protect them, for instance, and by being proactive about risk exposure where possible, avoiding, preparing for recovery, ensuring, recruiting and training. Without the support of policies which explain the reason for controls, there is a danger seen in many organisations that technical controls, such as access controls, are seen as a challenge just to be cracked. But don't forget, don't get me wrong, it must be recognised that policies will work best when used in partnership with technical solutions. Both are important. Policies cannot be ignored. It must be reiterated that to be effective, policies must be communicated to all personnel through the three layers explained earlier, policies, standards and procedures, to bring the knowledge to all three layers, executive, management and operations people, in a relevant manner. The introduction of a security awareness program will also ensure that personnel take information security much more seriously. To what extent do you feel organisations just pay lip service to the concept of policy? For instance, they have one, but they don't actually apply it. In my world, it's only the largest organisations that are bothered to establish policies. And thinking back over my career of inspecting clients' current information security policy documents, it is usually best described as a library book. It has not been written as a document to be regularly applied to business on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a reference book and used as a policy-only reference. It's not used as a guidebook to show the way. When it is brought to life by expressing it as policies, one sentence, standards, one paragraph, and policies, procedures, one page, it becomes a working reference. It is readily referenced online, not stored in the company library. So for me, information security policy is brought to life by the addition of standards and procedures and an awareness program including circulation of the appropriate penalties and awards for demonstrating information security care. Nothing will strengthen the resolve of personnel more quickly than to understand that management is prepared to penalise its management and staff for not following the procedures and it is also prepared to promote if they do follow the procedures. However, still today many organisations do, as you say, pay lip service to the concept of policy. So how can we go beyond this? With the effort already invested in establishing policy, it seems at best a missed opportunity if the efforts aren't then made to embed it. The launch and continued reminder of the importance of information security procedures can, over time, create a powerful information security culture. This is expressed by an upward trend in security behaviour throughout the organisation, managers being armed with standards against which to measure or value performance, and a means of penalising lapses in information security care. Having personnel caring for information security is a must in the information transformation age where individual responsibility has never been more important. Yes, the idea of having them care about security is an aim that I'd fully agree with and I think we'll come back to some related issues in later questions. But before that I'd like to take a step back and ask whether you have any advice on how to go about developing policy. Is there an off-the-shelf solution that organisations could adopt as a baseline or is there always going to be a necessary degree of tailoring in order to ensure that it speaks to the specific audience involved? In my practice, I use ISO 27001 control objectives and controls plus my own information transformation age additions as the standard against which I measure performance of each client in this area. I start such projects with a health check, what security procedures, standards and procedures are currently in place. This usually gains senior management's attention because usually there is no recognition of ISO 27001 and it sometimes promotes the need to carry out a risk management exercise. Even without the risk analysis, when the boardroom realises that they are nowhere near the ISO standard, the next stage of developing the one sentence policies, one paragraph standards and a page of procedures is usually requested. That's what works for me. Getting organisations to take notice that there is a gap. Taking another argument to support going through the process of developing the organisation's own policy standards and procedures 
It is the value of the journey that leaves a long-lasting impression. There are policy manuals available off the shelf, but when the organisation shapes its own interpretation of needs to fit its own circumstances, being guided by an ISO standard, it has a higher value than a bought one. How can policy be best promoted? Historically, it seems that in many cases, organisations have gone little further than developing a policy and somehow making it available to staff for reference purposes. Although such a passive approach still ticks the box in terms of policy being in place for staff to comply with, it doesn't really get into the spirit of supporting them to properly understand it and the part they can play with it. In a sense, it goes back to my earlier comment about them paying lip service to it. And so what are the recommendations for a more comprehensive approach here? OK, I have a few points I wish to make in answering this. Firstly, and most importantly, express the policies, in inverted commas, in a form relevant to each level of the organisation as explained earlier, and have owners of the policies, owners of standards and owners of procedures who are responsible for the adherence by the workshop and the office floor. Secondly, Right from the start, employees at all levels must be introduced to the policy standards and procedures in printed format during recruitment, induction, and as part of the job description material. This should be followed up by on-the-job training by seniors. Thirdly, policy standards and procedures must be accessible from office computers, laptops, iPads, and iPhones. They should be accompanied by full explanations of desired outcomes and the reasons they have been introduced. Frequently asked questions must be available in the same location. Fourthly, an information security awareness program should be considered for the launch of the new set of information security policy standards and procedures and repeated annually, perhaps during information security week, which is a popular time in some countries. Fifthly, Security awareness must also be considered in appointments of management and staff to sensitive positions. Police checks, proof of qualifications, personnel reference and business reference follow-ups are all essential if the position is sensitive. There's a number of good ideas there, and that can certainly help to ensure the policy gets wider visibility. However, I guess there's always going to be the potential for people who won't naturally accept it and who are more responsive to the stick than to the carrot. Do you have any thoughts around these folks, and how do you handle situations in which the policy, standards and procedures aren't followed? Yes, people are people, Steve. They have frailties, they gamble, they take drugs, they have affairs, they get divorced. But as an old fraud squad chief once told me years ago, in every organisation, 70% of the people are honest, and we can recognise those. 10% of the people are dishonest, and we can usually recognise those. But for 20%, well, it just depends on where they are at the time of the temptation. So penalties for non-adherence must be included as part of the information security promotion. Penalties are often missing or never clearly expressed. They must be present for every procedure and considered for standards and processes. Careful consideration must be given in relation to the consistency of application. There should be no exceptions and it must be made very clear. Severity of the punishment must be thought about. Management and staff must support the idea of having penalties. Incident record records being securely entered into staff records for performance review must be made available. The option of giving second chances must be thought about. And clear communication of the policy standards and procedures is, is mandatory. Also, there must be a clear reporting arrangement for transgressions so that they can be reported to an appropriate authority, the audit desk, governance officer, information security manager. A reporting format must be in place so that all relevant circumstances and proofs of transition can be consistently collected and multiple inc incidents recorded. So do you have any thoughts on what other types of support might be needed here? It is helpful if an appropriate senior executive endorses the introduction of policy standards and procedures and explains the benefits expected, including the encouragement of the growth of a security aware culture in the organisation. This can be helped along with perhaps quarterly reports of adherence records. I have introduced the one sentence policies on information security posters within an office in my time. Get it out there, not hidden away, it's usually well accepted. I've had the standards discussed in monthly corporate magazines. 
A suggestions box has been used to fine-tune effectiveness of all three levels, policies, standards and procedures. If you do have information security policies in place, they should be reviewed with the ideas here explored, particularly if your policies are not yet addressing the information transformation age. On a long-term basis, as the business changes and as the information transformation gathers pace, a review of policy effectiveness must be carried out at some stage. What do you think ought to happen in the event where a policy breach is reported? This may sound very litigious, but it is aimed at ensuring that natural justice is available to the accused, a very important issue. Breaches must be properly reported to the appropriate officer. The accused must be given every chance to present his or her side of the story with the help of a senior HR person at the preliminary hearing, in inverted commas. If the breach can be proven or the accused admits guilt, a hearing committee can discuss penalty options and an appropriate disciplinary action taken and recorded. It is essential that the process is transparent and the accused has access to natural justice. And the use of these terms preliminary hearing and hearing committee and those things must be suited to the organisation. You just what I'm labelling for this discussion. The essential elements in the hearing to abide by natural justice demands are firstly under the heading of evidence, the policy standard or procedure allegedly breached must be recorded. The identity of the accused and any accomplices must be recognised. The details of the breach the evidence that the breach was carried out and the impact of the breach. All of these elements must be presented as evidence. In the second stage, the hearing, there will be a preliminary hearing or a preliminary ruling and there is a case to be answered, whether there is a case to be answered or not. There must be an advocate for the accused, someone to support. There must be an appropriate hearing committee made up of suitable members. Cases for and against the accused must be established. Any personal hardship or extenuating circumstances captured. And in the third point is the in-house finding, if it's appropriate. The finding, the penalty, record of the process and entry into HR files. Or, if it isn't appropriate for an in-house, the case must be made for a judicial system to be involved with police and courts. Now this process has always been important, but even more so now with social networking ever present in businesses and government. Instant news, in inverted commas, from a grapevine of this nature can be very damaging to the organisation's reputation without the full story. So overall then, how would you summarise the role of policies, standards and procedures in the world of InfoSec? The use of policy standards and procedures is often considered as an easy way out because of the deterrent factor rather than a prevention factor. However, when it becomes part of the corporate culture in the ethos of, the like, of an organisation, it packs a powerful punch in the fight to make information security more effective. Management and staff will encourage, remind and counsel each other in doing the right thing. Security is then seen as a tool to ensure that the business continues rather than being seen as a nuisance that should be ignored or can be ignored. How do we make sure that security is seen as a value rather than a nuisance? The documentation must be created in simple, unambiguous language at all three levels. The documentation must be available online for reference by all personnel. Penalties for breaches must be clearly included. The penalties must be fair, effective and be exercised every time a breach is reported, no excuses. Information security awareness programs must be created and published regularly. Any trends in breaching patterns must be recognised. They can be used to trigger warnings to all staff or, if needed, encourage training to reduce such breaches. Finally, the link between executives policies and senior management standards and operational staff procedures should be explained so that personnel know that the whole organisation is behind the drive to improve information security. This is a very important point. In closing, it should also be said that the ISO 27001 is predicated upon the establishment of, of an information security management system within the context of the organisation's business risks. 
Logically, therefore, a risk management exercise should precede the development of the policy standards and procedures so that the risk profile can be addressed. And this is not always carried out. Yes, it's certainly important to lay all the foundations in the right order. And I think that's also a very good point with which to bring the session to a close. Kevin, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us again. Thank you, Steve. It's my great pleasure. I look forward to doing it again sometime soon in this series, perhaps in relation to business continuity management. Thank you for listening.